Big day shaping up for central banks. European Central Bank President Mario Draghi preparing to deliver his final policy decision of his more than eight-year tenure at the ECB. And what happens in Europe today could certainly have meaningful impact here at home as our own Federal Reserve prepares to release its next policy decision a little less than a week from today. Joining us now is former Minneapolis Federal Reserve President and current Lionel McKenzie Professor of Economics at the University of Rochester, Nariana Kochalakota. Nariana, it's great to see you again. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, do you believe that, that our Fed will cut rates uh, when they meet on October 30th? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Brian. I do expect the Fed to cut rates uh, by another uh, quarter percentage point um, in, uh, when they meet at the, uh, at the end of October. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I think the, 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 the drivers for that kind of decision are, are the same as for the previous two cuts. I think that they're worried about downside risks to the U.S. outlook um, and also uh, worried about uh, uh, continued low inflation, which is keeping them be uh, below their target of 2%. But what changed so much from last year? Rate hikes? Was it just the markets collapse in December? Is it the trade fight? Is it political pressure? Is it something else? I think the one thing I'd rule out for sure out of the, out of the possible drivers you mentioned are, is political pressure. I think that, um, as Chair Powell has uh, said publicly, and I, I, and I know from my own uh, tenure at the institution, uh, they don't pay any attention to, to the politics of the situation. They're, they're, they're focused on the economics. No, I think what you saw in, mar you saw in markets, uh, and, and here I'll speak a little bit for myself, I think especially in, in, in bonds, uh, longer-term bonds, you saw concerns about downside risk to the global economy materialize that the Fed felt they had to take on board. Where are those downside risks coming from? Well, I think they're emanating from the White House. I think that uh, the president is a huge source of, of economic uncertainty for the world. And um, that uncertainty is leading mm -hmm. firms to cut back on, on investment and on, on how, to a lesser extent, I think, leading households to cut back on spending. And so that, that's a downside risk to the economy that the, the Fed has to to do its best to address. You know, certainly maximizing employment, one of the two edicts for the Federal Reserve, Nariana, but yet we've had some weaker than expected job numbers as of late, but I, there's a school of thought, at least among people that I've talked to, where the job numbers are going to be weak because there's simply, we've run out of workers. There's seven plus million open jobs and you, you can't add jobs mm -hmm. if there are no people to take those jobs. Do, do you feel the data accurately reflects the economy? In other words, is a weaker jobs number necessarily a sign of a slowdown or simply a sign of everybody needs workers? Yeah, I think it's, a, you know, at some point uh, we're going to have to get used to seeing uh, non, uh, NFP uh, growth numbers on the order of 100,000 a month. That's going to have to happen or, you know, even less than that. Just as you say, because... That's organic growth in the economy, and there's not going to be any workers left. Are we there yet? I mean, that's really the, the, the right question to be asking. And I, for myself, I look at two, two data points to, to inform my judgment on that. One uh, is, as an economist, you've got to look at prices as well as quantities. I think wage growth remains, uh, uh, you know, it's certainly picked up, which is great. But I think the, it's slow enough to make me think that, boy, uh, companies are, are not running out of workers because they, they would be bidding more for worker services and we'd see more wage growth if, if that were true. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, I, I, I look at the fraction of people who, who uh, are age 25 to 54 in the prime of their working life that have a job, and that's come back to where it was before the Great Recession, but it's still not as mm -hmm. high as it was at the end of the 1990s. So I, the, both of those numbers... Uh, uh, still muted wage growth and relatively low prime age employment uh, give me reason to think that we could actually drive more workers into this into this economy. Well, we got to do something, but I think that the wage issue is one because, you know, the wage numbers come out and we say, oh, there you go, no one's getting paid. But then again, it's a very confusing time, Ariana, because there's so many millennials in the workforce. There's 85 to 88 million of them in general. They're entering the workforce. They're replacing older workers. By default, their salary is not going to be as high as the 59-year-old who's leaving the workforce, the 25-year-old coming in and doing a relatively similar job. That, there's going to be a pay discrepancy there, which reflects the data. But it's, again, it's not a sign of bad things. It's just that 
you don't get paid a lot when you start working. <laughs> No, I, that's right, and I, so that that's something you know. We, you, that's uh, where you pick that up. I think is in the fact that productivity is uh, a growth is slowed, and that's because when you you're enter the people who enter the workforce, the skills they have are not as as developed as those who are, who uh, have been in the workforce for a long time, and who they, they who they end up replacing. So, but uh, having said that, you know the the. The, if you look at how wages behave relative to productivity, so how much uh, firms are paying out in terms of what they're generating from each worker, that still remains low relative to where we were uh, mm -hmm. at the before the Great Recession. So that's, again, a sign that there's room for more labor market competition. Uh, that, that Yes, firms always complain they can't find workers, as I well know. Well, Even in 2010 and 2011, firms were saying they couldn't find qualified workers. But the, the proof of the pudding is always in, the, in those wage numbers. Yeah, it's probably more geography, too. you got to get workers to where there are jobs, but maybe they can't move. Question outside of that, Nariana, to wrap it up. You've studied what they call optimal tax design, sort of a student of that as well as, as obviously a professor. A lot of talk about taxes on the super wealthy coming into this election here. What is our, our best tax play? Will you know, super high rates on the very wealthy, will it accomplish the goals that politicians are hoping for? Well, you know, I'm not, not always sure what politicians are trying to accomplish through their plan, so I, I, I don't want to comment on that. I, I, I do think from an economist's point of view that when you tax wealth, there's a lot of dynamic incentives you have to take into account. That, that uh, you know, I start a business, and what, what's incentivizing me to start that business is it's, some of it is the chance to really become super wealthy. And so when you start to say, you know, I don't want anyone who has, I want to tax away all of the, the, the income on wealth from people who are, who are, uh, got $50 million. Uh, and if you say you're talking, uh, talking about a tax, a tax of 3%, say on, on 50 million and above, you're pretty much getting all the risk-free return and even more out of those people. So you're really disincentivizing people to have more than $50 million in wealth. That spills back to people who have only 10 million and 5 million. And those dynamic incentives, I think, are ones that could really slow growth in the economy. And I, I hope mm -hmm. that uh, um, the politicians who are proposing these kinds of plans are taking those dynamic effects into account. Nariana Kochalakota, former Minneapolis Fed Bank president up there in Rochester now. Nariana, it's great to see you again. Don't be a stranger. Thanks for joining us here on Worldwide Exchange. Thanks for having me on, Brian.